Hi, Anthea. Hey, Sarah. How's it going? Good. I'm Sarah Posner. This is The Posner Show. And today with me is Anthea Butler of the University of Pennsylvania, who is going to talk with me about Pope Francis and, in particular, some new developments coming out of the Vatican with Francis's appointment of new cardinals. Um, and we'll touch on some other things relating to Pope Francis, but let's start with that, since that's in the news right now, since that just happened on Sunday. Um and there's a piece in the New York Times today. The headline is Pope with the Humble Touch is Firm in Reshaping the Vatican, which describes um, some discontent within the Vatican of people who've been cast over or feel like their their views or positions aren't being taken into account or represented by Francis. So, well, what's your take on... On the way, I mean, it's it's not like he can completely reshape the College of Cardinals overnight, right? Because, no, no. Um, he added he added six or eight, um, but that's just six or eight out of how many? Well, yeah, are there? I'll yeah, say. and I mean, yeah. you know, what we got was it nineteen total or something like that. I, I mean, I think everyone is is surprised because one, there's no Americans on the list. There's one North American, right? Um, from from Can who's Canada, but actually was um, raised in the United States. And mm -hmm. a lot of the cardinals seem to be from you know what we would sort of turn a two thirds world. So let me let me sort of outline what's happening. One is we shouldn't have expected any Americans because there was no place to put any Americans, okay, or to elevate. I mean, you could make a case for uh, perhaps here in Philadelphia we have Archbishop Chaput. We've always had a cardinal here for a long time. So he didn't do that. You know, okay, sera, sera. But I think what's more important about the choices is that this is something about, for at least in my mind, about parity. And what I mean by parity is this. Where does the church uh, have more people right now? Where do we need to look for the life of the church? And what kind of cardinals does he want to create? And I think I'm going to bring in another title to talk about this, and I think it's really important. Um, last week, or maybe the week before, the Pope said, I'm not uh, uh, putting up the title of Monsignor anymore. We don't want that. And there were people who had people slated Which is sort of an honorary title yeah. given to it's, the priest, yeah, it's, right? yeah, and it's an honorary title, exactly. But what, mm -hmm. what that signals to me is that he's like, look, you people have been chasing titles too much. And now I want you to think about what it really means behind the title instead of the kinds of perks that come with that, you know, your, your free trips to Rome, you know, the, the Beretta, all this other stuff. You need to think about what this really means to be a cardinal. And so I think his, his idea about being a shepherd is really important for him. I also mm -hmm. think that um, when we see a place getting a cardinal like Haiti, which has been a thoroughly Catholic country for years and has never had a cardinal right. before. Right, and has never had a cardinal? Never had a cardinal. This is the first cardinal for right. Haiti. And I think, it's, I yeah. think that's really important. Then you start to understand what he's doing. I also think he's sort of breaking up a cabal. And what I mean by a cabal is the, the, the heavy lock that the Italians have had on the... Um, on the House of Cardinals. I mean, there's, you know, it, historically there were lots of reasons for that. In the day that we live in right now, in a place where, you know, a very small population in Italy is actually going to mass every day, what is the point of having all of these cardinals who wield enormous power over the church and who are still stuck in maybe the 17th, 18th, and barely the 19th century? So explain that. In what way are they stuck in another century? And you're not really talking necessarily about their political views, which I think a lot of Americans tend to associate with uh, the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops here, right? Yeah. But yeah. you're really talking about the way the church itself is run and governed, Ex right? Exactly. So the kinds of ecclesiastical dignities that people get, the kinds of things that move through the Vatican, the problems that have ha been happening with the Vatican Bank, a lot of that has to do with, you know, um, old school sorts of things. And if you, wanna, if you want to believe the rumor mill, part of it also has to do with, oh, if the mafia is very afraid, of, of this Pope, or they're very upset that he's cleaning things up, then are we to assume that some of these higher place clerics have some deals on the ground? I, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that it's very interesting that he's trying to wrestle the, um, 
an axis of power away from Italy, which I think is a good thing. Or as um, uh, somebody said to me, it takes an Italian to know the Italians. And, you know, we forget that he does speak Italian and his dad was Italian and everything else. And so I think that this is a deft move on his part to try to shift the axis of power towards the kinds of cardinals that he feels that he can work with. So, well, previous to uh, Francis, were, were, I mean, were any of his immediate predecessors at all interested in um, breaking this cabal or breaking this, what you call, access of power within the Vatican itself? No, I mean, because I... You're literally talking about the way money is handled, well, yeah. the way the bureaucracy mm-hmm. is set up. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't think that they were. I mean, I don't see Benedict. I mean, some in some ways to me, Benedict, it, it, you could make a case for him not being this, but also I see him as a company guy because he'd been in Rome for so long over the, the CDF right. and then, mm-hmm. you know, being the right. Pope. But I, I think, you know, part, you know, if I wanted to speculate besides his age and, and health, if I wanted to speculate about the reasons why he might have resigned, I would say part of it has to do with he couldn't get control of these guys. And, you know, I, I, I hate to make the reference to uh, Pope Francis's past life, but, you know, he was a bouncer. And if you got a bouncer, your, your job is to bounce some people. And I think he's bouncing some folks. I mean, look at what happened. Now, do you think do you think the Cardinals knew this? So this is interesting because since he started appointing Cardinals and making the changes that he made, like demoting certain Cardinals and not reappointing Cardinal Burke and putting Cardinal mm-hmm. Worrell in his place. I mean, did, didn't did they, when they elected him Pope, do you think they knew he was going to do this? Do you think there was any intentionality on their part that is like, yeah, we do need this guy? Or do you think this has come as a surprise? Oh, well, I don't know that they thought it was a surprise. I mean, listen, let's, let's go back. I mean, let's, let's, let's back up a little bit. First of all, it's a surprise when you have a Pope reside. Okay, so that's the first surprise. So that you know, even before Francis got there, we're, our, you know, the church is already in a in a stunned state. You know, you, no matter who you are, you're going. The Pope resigned, and then you get another Pope. We have two living, you know, two living popes, right? So you're already surprised. So anything that comes after that, you know, this is not business as usual, right? It's just not going to be business as usual, and in that sense. They already knew this was a shakeup, and we'll never know all the intrigue on the ground at the Vatican. Right. But I mean, all the rumor, the, the rumor mills about things that you know Benedict found out or he didn't find out, and, and all of that, I really played into the sense of unease. So the church was already uneasy. I mean, at least the, the 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 princes of the church were uneasy. Let's put it like that, because they knew that you know this is not business as usual it was never going to be business as usual now i mean the, the if you go back and you start to think about the symbolic things that francis has done it would tell you already that he was up to something i mean he's not living in the in the papal quarters you know he's he's deciding i'm going to have my residence in a different place he starts you know sort of moving things around a little bit he's he's out there in the streets with people you know you have this uptick in everybody coming so yeah i mean this is not business as usual in in one sense but in another sense it is because there's always this this ebb and flow in the church he's just deciding to make some different decisions and i think that's where um the press would do well at least the media to say realize that this is a 2000 plus year old institution it's not going Mm. to move very quickly and even though you might think these changes are big you still have people with you know core catholic beliefs in those positions in the positions of cardinal so, right, exactly. And including the Pope himself. He has core Catholic mm-hmm. beliefs. I mean, it's not like he's, uh, I think that there's been an overplaying of some of the things and reading too much significance into some of the things that he has said. And um, even as some some Catholic writers have documented, the press has misreported some things that he's done. Um, and there's been these rumors and you know the satire site that um, said that he had abolished sin or there was a satire site that he had established a Vatican III council. Mm-hmm. And these things went viral because yeah. people were willing to believe them because they had been conditioned to believe that this Pope was revolutionary in the sense that he was going to drastically alter Catholic, Catholic doctrine. And so the fact that these things could even 
spread as viral rumors without being verified is, I think, a testament to how much positive press he's gotten. But, you know, I wrote about this um, last week on Religion Dispatches. Mm -hmm. I was talking about Luke Copton's piece in, over, you know, in The Spectator UK, in which he calls him a fantasy pope that has been created by the liberal media that so much wants um, this pope uh -huh. to be this figure as they portray him. So every movie makes is fit into that mold of, see, he's, he's so liberal and he's changing everything, um, even moves that he hasn't actually made. And David Gibson at Religion News Service wrote about all the things that got misreported or misinterpreted um, as being these radical changes that weren't really true mm -hmm. or had been interpreted in such a way that was misleading. Um, and I think the headline on that piece was, you know, surprise, the Pope is still Catholic. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. I, I have to say, personally, I, I want to get that out there on the record. That blog was horrific, and it traveled so far, and really smart people sent it to me. The one about the Vatican, the Vatican III, III, III Council, III yeah. And, 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 and I, mm -hmm. you know, there are a lot of people who, there are some people who said that this misinformation campaign hasn't just been by the media, it's been by some Catholic conservatives who want to take him to the edge. In other words, how can we besmirch him? Let's put out a lot of false information out there. And so I think you've got two kinds of things going on. One is the fantasy pope, yeah. and one is the, mm -hmm. we, we don't like this guy, and so let's just start saying some stuff and see if it'll so stick. They're trying, you're saying that there are some conservative Catholics who are trying to sabotage. Well, I would, say not, I, I would not say sabotage is the strongest word, but perhaps mm -hmm. to make more of things than they ought. And and that is that's undermining some of it. Yeah, un un undermining <laughs> some of it. So I think you know this is yeah. this is fear on all the you know the hope on one side that oh gosh it could be better, and then the, on the other side is the fear of what is going to happen. But I but I also think that there's there's something that's worth saying, and and, and this is really important. If you think about the Catholic Church like a big giant business. Anytime you get a new CEO, you got to change things. You have to change. There's no way that you can continue to do what has been done in the past. And the Catholic Church is a bad shape between the pedophilia scandal, you know, the money scandals with the with the Vatican Bank, you know, all sorts of other kinds of malfeasance going on. I mean, Pope Francis has been a breath of fresh air, but that does not change the structural issues that need to be that need to be dealt with. And I think well, he wants to address the structural, and he issues, absolutely does. And yeah, I think he does. And I think that this is part of addressing the structural issues is to move people around like Burke, who you know, on one minute we don't know what he's doing. I mean, I thought that was the funniest thing is that you know, one minute Burke is saying we don't know what this Pope is doing. You know, I'm paraphrasing what he says, and next thing you know, he's back at home and he's got to pull his liturgical garments up. And he can't, you know, well, you know, it's something that I thought there. was interesting, you know, this happened a few weeks ago when, when Burke basically didn't get reappointed mm -hmm. to his position, which was, now I can't remember what the title was, but he was, he held this particular position at the Vatican. Now, Burke is not just conservative. I mean, he's like an out there conservative. A few years ago, he did this video for Randall Terry. You know, he's just like, he's really like mm -hmm. really on the far right. And so uh, Francis replaces him with, Cardinal Whirl, who's the uh, Cardinal of Diocese of Washington, D.C., here. Um, and, you know, and I think in the American press it was portrayed as, wow, you know, Francis is really ditching the conservatives here, but Whirl is a conservative. Whirl is I mean, a conservative. It's not like Whirl is yeah. some... Yeah, but Whirl's a conservative. I don't even, I don't know if, would you even characterize him as a moderate? No, no, I would say he's a conservative. Burke is yeah. so out there. Burke is so, I mean, well, But in comparison, Whirl looks like a moderate, yeah, right? Yeah, exactly, but that's exactly right. But see, Whirl is smarter. And I'm saying smarter in the sense of that right. he knows how to talk about these things. Burke is just, it, it's inflammatory speech. Right. So right. in other words, right. what, this so is what Francis doesn't for like. Bishops. That's what the, yeah, the congregation right, for bishops. Right. And what he didn't like was all this outspokenness. And I think this is what, you know, the U.S. conference has to be worried about is that this kind of political thing, rather than taking care of the, the parishioners, you know, and your, and your mm -hmm. archdiocese and your diocese is, is tantamount for Francis. That what he, that's what he wants. He wants, you know, less hyperbole, more love. Let's talk about the poor. Yes, all these other things are important, but at the same time, I don't need you all out here, you know, grandstanding. And that's what was happening with people like Burke. I mean, remember Burke is the one, I believe, back in 2004, who said he didn't want to give communion to Carrie 
if I'm not mistaken, I think this, he's the one. So, I mean, there's all these, this sort of thing going on where they became, the, the cardinals and these bishops became very political figures in the United States, or as the, the way that I said it was, they sounded more like evangelicals than they did Catholics. So right. I think... Well, I want to get to that yeah. in a minute, but I, I, with regard to changing the bureaucracy in the Vatican, I mean, is that something that's controversial among rank-and-file Catholics? I think that... You know, obviously, if he were to, as he's been rumored to, change Catholic doctrine in some radical way, which it doesn't appear that he's done or even intends to, that would be controversial. But for yeah. rank-and-file Catholics, whether they're liberal or conservative, is reforming the bureaucracy of the Vatican something that people are against? No, no. And I, I don't even think half of them know what it is half of the time. I mean, people don't know what these offices are. I mean, they might pay attention to the elevation it's of a cardinal. It's Byzantine, right? Yeah, so it's Byzantine. It's, it's, yeah. It's, you know, it's hard for those of us who talk about this stuff every day to remember all these offices. So that doesn't, right. I mean, it doesn't affect the everyday person. What I do think it does, though, is... is, is, is ultimately all, it does. Yeah, but, ultimately, you know, when it right. trickles down. But I think what it does... Mm. Right now, in this interim period where everybody's trying to figure out, you know, who Francis is and what he's going to do, is to set up a sense of which is this a radical pope? Is you know, is he you know, where can we put him? And I think it's the the issue is you know, once you hear him say, you know, on the one hand, you know, he says Sunday while baptizing kids in the Sistine Chapel, if you have to nurse feed your child, so he doesn't care about somebody right. breastfeeding in the Sistine Chapel. But on the other hand, he talks about you know abortion is 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 a sin. It's you know horrific. we need to it's horrific, horrific. It's, yeah, yeah horrific, right. right? So so I mean, there's you, you have to hold him together where he is, and I think that he's very much a traditionalist, and we can't make him into like this big giant liberal. But I think he's taking away the things that don't matter. And that's, that's what I think is important. I think what he's saying is, is I don't want the kind of speech that doesn't matter, that only gets a sound bite as opposed to what we're supposed to be doing for people. And I think right. I want to go back to a more you know inclusive church instead of the kind of church that Benedict was thinking of, which is we're going to make it a pure church. It'll just be smaller, but right. we can make it, you right. know, we can make it like we want. This guy is saying, right. come on, everybody. I don't have a problem with you, but you need to know that these are the rules. That's the difference. Right. Well, okay, so it, he, the appointment of the new cardinals, he was shifting, he appeared to be shifting power away from the United States. Mm -hmm. No new cardinals got appointed in the United States. He appointed the first cardinal from Haiti, one of the world's poorest countries, yeah. right? Yeah. And, you know, it's kind of an amazing thing because, you know, it's, uh, you can sort of see an analogy to Haiti's relative power in the world. Mm -hmm. Um, in within the church, you know, they had no cardinal for all these years, even though is Catholicism the predominant religion there? Or yeah, yeah, the, it, it, yeah, it is, uh, yeah. it is. Um, and so, uh, you know, so I think that that says a lot about, you know, the power shifting that he's trying to do uh, within the church. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, so I guess you have to wonder... For his critics, for his critics from his right, or apparently from his right, mm -hmm. is the concern really about how he talks about unfettered capitalism, or is it more about this shifting of the balance of power? Do you think that is what concerns them? It's the and shifting of the balance of power. American conservatives shifting the balance of power within the church, mm -hmm. because really, this. Um, you know, sort of like the Acton Institute free market is free market principles are consistent with Catholicism mm -hmm. or, you know, small government uh, is consistent with the concept of subsidiarity. You know, these are American ideas. Yeah, they're very much So ideas. perhaps what concerns them is not just that he's criticizing trickle down economics. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Or, or libertarianism, but that he's also actually shifting or could be shifting over time their power within the church. Oh, absolutely. So it's not just absolutely. about the ideology. No, it's not it's about, about ideology. Power. It's it's about actual power. I mean, think about it. I mean, listen, mm -hmm. it's just it's, so we've got we had an appointment in the Ivory Coast, we had an appointment in Brazil, we had an appointment in Argentina, right. South Korea, Chile. I'm just naming off some names here. I'm not gonna name off the names of the bishops. I just want to say the places. Burkina Faso, F Philippines, Haiti. 
Okay. Now, what's right. now to me? What this is is two things. One is is that these are not traditional locations of power of power in the church, but they are very important in this way. These are all places where the church has to compete on the ground with charismatic movements and Pentecostalism. Mm-hmm. And and so this is it, or you know evangelicals coming in. So I think this is also about how do we keep our people. This is this is not about you know this this power that's in, in, encased in Italy. And I think this is a very smart move on his part because I, you know one thing he said is I still want ecumenical dialogue. I still want this to happen. But in choosing these cardinals from these places, these are also places where Catholics are being peeled off the left and right. Okay, and so if you're going to show up your church in the places where there are a lot of Catholics, but they're leaving the church, what do you do? You put some, you, you put cardinals in those places, and you leave we behind these places that, where they're dead. That there are a lot of Catholics in the United States, but they're being peeled away, not necessarily. Well, yeah, but we don't, but we didn't have any space for any charismatic movement. But we by yeah, but it's secular. also a question of space. We don't have a space. I mean, we just oh. make some more people, and we need to have some people retire. We don't have anybody that's really you know close to eighty right now. And so why make, you know, why make more, ca- why make more cardinals in a place that's been in so much trouble like America? And if you wanted to send mm-hmm. a message to the, to the, to the cardinals and the bishops here, then you don't make any more. You say, I'm going to put you guys on the side for a while. So what do you think, what is the message that he's trying to send them? Is the message that he's trying to send them is, is that you've gotten too comfortable with your position and the trappings of your position? Yeah, well, I mean... Or is it that mm-hmm. you've gotten too political and you've negatively, da- you know, you've damaged the image of the Catholic Church in the United States mm-hmm. by harping on all these, um, or in his words, yeah. assessing about two issues, mm-hmm. essentially. Yeah, well, I mean, basically, you know, what did he say? Don't let the head go to your head, you know? In other words, kind of don't let this thing the make hat. it. Yeah, the red hat make it go to you. You need to think about what this is going to be. It's not a promotion. It's not honor nor declaration. I'm quoting him. It is simply a service that requires you to broaden your gaze and open your heart. So you're not going to mm-hmm. give that to people who are like careerists. It's 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 very clear that the reason. I mean, the New York Times article was good, but one of the things that they need to lift out is that this is about. I want to get rid of the careerist, you know, you know how people sort of rise up in the ranks of the business and they're just, you know, I'm just chicken off the things till I can get to the top so I can just sit down and do nothing. This is what we got a lot of in the Catholic church. We got a lot of people who enjoy the perks of flying first class of doing all these things. And he's like, ah, we're not doing that stuff anymore. I, I want, you know, I want this to be austere. I want this about service. I want this about, you know, think about what you're supposed to be doing for the people of God, as opposed to thinking about what you're going to do for yourself. And that's okay. where I think that this becomes, this is a real issue for the careerists who are in the church right now who realize that this is a change. Okay. I also think that it, it's in keeping with um, sort of, I, I kind of think of it as a back page thinking of Jesuits not wanting, whole, you know, orders. It's a very big thing. And, and, you know, in the society, just to have a Jesuit Pope is really something. I keep coming back to that over and over again, because, you know, in theory, you shouldn't have a Jesuit Pope. It, because the, Jes- the, the Jesuits declare allegiance to the Pope as their fourth vow. And that means, you know, we, we don't want ecclesiastical dignities. We want to go do this other thing. And so I think that the way he's dealing with this is very much from his Jesuit perspective of, you know, mm-hmm. I have this office, mm-hmm. but I'm supposed to be about the people. I'm supposed to be about promoting, you know, the, the message of the gospel, evangelizing. And that's what I'm about. And that's what I want my people that I appoint to be about. And if you look right. across, you know, the states right now, we don't have a lot of people like that. We've had a lot of people who have hitched their star to the culture war as opposed to anything else. Mm-hmm. Well, I thought it was really interesting, um, you know, Archbishop Kurtz, who's the new president of the U.S. Conference mm-hmm. of Catholic Bishops, who I think um, in the wake of his election was definitely talked about in the Catholic press as being in the Francis mold because he was very pastoral. Mm-hmm and not overtly political, even though, you know, he had been to protests at abortion clinics and he was, um, uh, you know, very much against same-sex marriage mm-hmm. and sort of the usual things. Um, but I guess it was, he was pastoral at the same time, you know, while he's still engaged in those kind of political issues. Yeah. But I thought it was really interesting. He did an op-ed for Religion News Service where he framed the, uh, 
opposition to the contraception mandate, which you know many dioceses and other Catholic organizations are not only opposed to, but are litigating, spending time and money litigating in federal court. Um, he framed that as an issue about poverty. And so mm-hmm. the way he framed it was, if uh, the Obama administration uh, is insistent on making us comply with the contraception mandate, we won't do that because it's against our religious freedom, but we will have to pay these ruinous fines and then it will destroy the Catholic charities and the other social services organizations and they won't be able to provide those services to the poor. So it was like this very clever yeah. um, sleight of hand mm-hmm. where it's like, okay, how do I talk about poverty? Okay, this is how I'll talk about poverty. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's similar to what Catholic charities argued in states where same-sex adoption became legal. They decided to close their doors entirely to doing adoption placements so that they wouldn't have to do placements to same-sex couples. And they basically framed it as uh, same-sex adoption made us go out of business. And it's same-sex adoption's fault that we're no longer providing these services Mm -hmm. to needy people. Mm -hmm. So it it was almost like he was... Um, it appeared that he was trying to pay homage to what the Pope has been talking about, but continuing to frame it within this very narrow frame that the bishops have been using for the past two or three years, you know, since the contraception coverage became an issue. Yeah. Well, he's a lot smarter. He could tack faster. I mean, you know, the rest of them, it was going to take them a little time to figure out how to elide the lines. But I do think, um, one of one of the things that is going to be the this poverty will keep coming up in in fact because this is going to be sort of a defining issue. I think you know every pope likes to pick something, and uh, this is I think this is going to be Francis's thing. No no doubt. I mean, there's only so much you can do when you're 77, and you know you, maybe you live till 90, maybe you live a little longer, maybe you don't. Mm-hmm. You have to decide where you're gonna you're gonna you know, make that line, and he's made this line for poverty. The question will be. Was where where will the leaders of the church go? Will they go with him, or will he have to do a little more cleaning house before things get on an even keel? And I think. It, but doesn't the cleaning house have to do with that though? Well, I mean, it does. Has to do with stop being so into all the trappings of your office. It is, but and start thinking about yeah. being more pastoral. But right? but part of it is is about resources. Where are these resources being? Where are resources going right now? And I think that if there's a more emphasis on Catholic charities and some other things that are happening in the church right now, then these resources and more transparency about the money and, you know, a more concerted effort, at least on my part, to see uh, the um, the end of all of these sex abuse scandals and the church take some, you know, some serious responsibility and start paying off all the rest of the things and, and providing, you know, the kind of therapy and things that people need. Then I think we we turn a corner. But until that happens, I, I think from from in my position, and personally, my opinion is that I think that the church will still have a lot of issues, and it won't matter if you start changing the people if you don't. You know, you can't change the ethos. You can't change what happened to make the pedophilia scandal so bad. The only way you change that is to not just change the rules, but you have to change the way that people deal with things. If you, th- I'll use an example. Um, in the case of Philadelphia, where we had all this trials, and we just had Monsignor Lynn let out of jail on a, on a technicality. He was the first diocese right. administrator to be convicted in the country. And he is now out on bail pending retrial or however the DA is going to deal with this. One of the things that's really important is how do you get people in office who are not so much sold out to canon law and protecting the offices as opposed to being pastoral with the people? And I think that's where the difference is. That's what I see Francis doing right now. In other words, what Mm -hmm. I what I see is someone who's saying, "Okay, we've had a lot of problems and a lot of the stuff that's happened in the church right now is due to this rampant clericalism and everything else. How can I change it? Well, I'm going to change it. But I need to start at the top and fixing these fixing these people. I'm going to take away some of these offices, and I'm going to make it very clear that our focus is, you know, poverty, poverty, poverty. Yeah, this other stuff is is good, but I don't want to be harping on homosexuality all the time. I don't want that to right. be the main conversation. Let's talk about family. Let's talk about faith. Let's talk about evangelism. I mean, it's not as though any of the stuff is switched. 
It's just that he's shifting it in order to shift the, you know, sort of change this big giant ship that is barely immovable and, you know, into another direction. And I think that's what this is all about. Right. Right. But isn't it possible that, I mean, you know, when it comes time to elect a new Pope, Mm -hmm. um, yes, he's put some people in there himself who will elect his predecessor. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, his successor. Um, But uh, at the same time, it's still, you know, there's still the people who weren't appointed by him and maybe wouldn't like the changes. And so there's always the possibility that it will revert back. Or do you think that these are changes that can last? Well, you know, think about the change. Uh, Let's go back to posts. Let's go back to John Paul II. I mean, John Paul stacked the Mm deck in so many kinds of ways. It's, you know, it's ridiculous. But I mean, he had years to appoint Cardinals. So I mean, we're talking about a lot of people who were appointed under him, a few that were appointed under Benedict. So, I mean, that, that has to take time to cycle out. And so it depends on how Mm -hmm. much Francis is going to be able to do. But if this is his first step, then we could say Mm -hmm. if he gets 10 years of appointments, then he might have changed what the College of Cardinals looks like. And then you might get a different Pope. But that that depends on how much, I mean, you never know, you know, how much time somebody's going to get. Right, exactly. But I do think the other, yeah, the other changes will make make some difference in the long run, too. The what? Other changes will make a difference in the long run, too. Right, right, right. So let's go back um, to what you were saying, that the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops has become more like evangelicals. Can you amplify on that a little bit? Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm thinking back to, you know, to all the uh, debate about religious freedom and the the birth control, cops, and everything. And so Mm. one of the things the Catholic bishops did, I guess it was two years ago, yeah, uh, the fortnight for freedom. I was just like, oh my God, this sounds like something, you know, something that came out of American Family Association or, you know, the focus on the family. I mean, it was like an evangelical-like campaign to get Catholics on board with all this. And like, Catholics kind of aren't those kind of people, you know? I mean, we might be interested in this, but to have this fortnight for freedom and uh, pass it out all this stuff and everything, I'm just like, you know, we're used to you asking us for money, you know, for collection, you know, to for like, you know, priest in another country or nuns or something like that. But fortnight for freedom, they're, they're trying to mobilize Catholics in the United States in a, in a different way. And I think one of the, the detriments, at least, you know, for the conference of Catholic bishops that they'll have to think about now in light of this new Pope is that they've put so, you know, they put so much stake in, in voicing their opinions, much the same way that evangelicals and Christian conservatives have made their arguments that it's very hard to have moral standing on the other side of having all the pedophilia scandals that, you know, the big things like Boston and, and, um, you know, Los Angeles, I just heard, I believe it's Sacramento or some places just now going as the diocese is filing for bankruptcy because of that. So they're in this, this position to, at one level, to try to talk about this high road about, you know, birth control and contraception and same-sex marriage. But at the same time, the moral status of the church has dropped so much because of all the scandals and the payouts. So they're in this mm-hmm. really weird position. It's like they're squawking and nobody's listening. And, and well, yeah. We- I mean, I, I think that that has a lot to do with sort of a political realignment in, mm-hmm. in American politics. Yeah. Where, I mean, the, the evangelical uh, Catholic alliance is not anything new. Nope, not at all. But I think that it has become more imperative for them with the numbers that they each have, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. And so it worked for them, especially under Benedict, who, you know, was talking about the pure church. We don't care if it's smaller as long as it's pure. And they kind of took that attitude too, and mm-hmm. in terms of you know they didn't care if they alienated um, rank and file Catholics mm-hmm. with their emphasis on the culture war issues. But I mean, politically at least, it seems. I mean, it seems to me that it's just a a new kind of alignment of religious interests in a political block. Yeah. Um, and not so new, but, you know, uh, more intense now. I mean, I would say that with the, it is. Fort, you know, the Manhattan Declaration and the Fortnite for Freedom, mm-hmm. that it became more intensified. Mm-hmm. And, um, and it seems like Francis is saying no to that now in terms of that being the sole focus of the 
bishops in the United States. Now, I think that for a lot of American news consumers, they overread that. They overread that as the Pope is going to change Catholic doctrine or perhaps the Pope isn't going to judge gay people or what have you, right? Mm -hmm. um, but it really is kind of a little bit subtler than that in that, you know, the Pope, I don't think, disagrees with them on the basic issues. Yeah. But then it's how they have had that play out in the political realm that I think he... He, he appears to take issue with. Yeah, yeah, and that's a good point. I also think that, you know, it's it's a sense in which I think the conference has to, to deal with a couple of things. I mean, one way they could write themselves right now and, and make it, like, profoundly better would be to think about, you know, immigration law. And, and this is something that they have been very vocal on. And, and, you know, in my opinion, at least, and from my standpoint, have been on the right side of, because obviously we have a lot of Latino Catholics in this country. And a lot of them, you know, come here and they are, you know, they immigrate from other places and they, they you know, they haven't gotten the, the right papers or whatever the case may be. And so this is a place where I think, you know, the, the conference of Catholic bishops here in the U.S. can really, you know, stake a claim and, and, and stake something that's very different. I'm not sure that the birth control issue gets them where they want to go, you know, in terms of, you know, bringing pe rallying people around. I mean, we all know that Catholics have feelings on birth control and they take it anyway. So it's not a question about who's supposed to pay for it. For Catholics, it's a question of, can I get it? You know, and, and right. yeah, you know, That's exactly. Cool. We're not going to listen to the church. playing out in court and yeah. we don't know how they're going to turn out. Yeah. No, we don't. Yeah, we don't yeah. know how it's going to turn yeah. out. But I think if they can turn their attention to thinking about, you know, and, and promoting more about it, you know, and passing, you know, real immigration law, that makes some sense. That's where I think they can gain some moral ground back. And, right. and they really need to gain that moral ground back. Well, listen, thanks so much Thank for you. talking about all this again. Yeah. Obviously, I love talking about it. Don't mind me. Okay. All right. Take thanks, care. Cynthia. Bye.